In the introductory part of this series, I tried to look at some of the forces at play in the development of German music at the end of the 60s and into the 70s. In this video, I'll be taking a look at some of the bands in more detail and the scenes that they came out of. Um, as I said in the introduction, there wasn't an awful lot going on in German culture throughout the 50s and 60s. Any music of note was usually imported, broadcast on shows like Beat Club, which managed to showcase a lot of the more adventurous end of rock. Um, as well as the Monks, who I mentioned in the uh, last episode, I'm particularly fond of the Beat Club recordings by the Small Faces and the Creation. But as brilliant as those bands were, they were firmly in an Anglo-American tradition. There was no, there was no original culture that young Germans could kind of get hold of. Uh, simply being another beat group in the London style would be to accept the status quo for young musicians. And accepting the status quo wasn't the way the wind was blowing. Um, what had been called beat music in Germany was was evolving, and of course, the Beatles exemplified this. And the Beatles' taste were definitely broadening at this uh, point in all directions. Uh, the divergence of influence from American rhythm and blues is shown clearly on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's. There on the back row is Karl Heinz Stockhausen peeping out. Now, Stockhausen was, of course, professor to both Ermin Schmidt and Holger Zucke. Uh, of Cannes, but in a roundabout way, it was the Beatles that inspired the band to actually form. See, after concluding his studies, uh, Holger Zuke was teaching music at a private school. Now, he, at this point, he paid no mind to pop music. His mind was on loftier matters. But one of his students, Michael Caroli, 10 years younger than him, uh, insisted to listen to what the Beatles were doing and not be so dismissive. Caroli's choice was I Am The Walrus and Zuke immediately sat up straight and listened. This was experimental music. They were using found sounds and radios just like he was. Also the composition, it wasn't, it wasn't a traditional 12 bar blues, it wasn't even a traditional diatonic harmony, it was all over the place. Um, straight away he phoned his friend Ermin Schmidt who was working as a composer at the time and he insisted they start a band together. So the band became about hit the ground running. Uh, the first track of their debut album Father Cannot Yell came together spontaneously. Uh, the, it's the first time they played together and it's the take you can hear on the record. One of the most astonishing things about Cannes music is that none of the classic material was actually recorded onto multi-track tape. It was them jamming in a room. Michael Caroli started off on violin and that informed his style. He had an expressive legato, an instinct for melody. His style was further informed by a love of Jimi Hendrix. Like Hendrix, his sound was based around a Stratocaster, fuzz and wah pedal. Zuke's bass lines were repetitive, groove-driven, simple and catchy. He was bass player kind of by necessity, the band needed one, but he also doubled as studio engineer, he set the mics up, he set the tape going. Ermin Schmidt brought an abstract approach to the keyboards, which was uh, uh, influenced by his avant-garde training. He used organ and electric piano with an increasing amount of uh, electronic mangling over the next few years. Now, as, as drummer, they enlisted Jackie Liebesitz, who was by now developing a new cyclical form of drumming. Um, it was one influenced by drummers like Elvin Jones and Max Roach. It was supple and disciplined, precise and expressive. Liebesitz had his Road to Damascus moment after being told by an audience member, you have to play monotonous. Now, monotonous is a pejorative word. Trance-inducing would maybe be a better description of what Jackie Leibzig was up to. Um, Yuda writes, and it's a showcase for his endless rotating rhythms. The rest of the band follow his lead. American singer Malcolm Mooney, uh, he particularly uses the repetition of rhythmic phrases, parts of speech. It results in like an abstraction of voice and rhythm. A drum beat, 21 hours a day. It wasn't far away from what their uh, reality was. Now, 
I haven't mentioned Mooney so far, but he's, uh, as I said, he's, he's joining the band this documented on Father Cannot Yell. The five of them kind of chanced upon something very different from what had gone before, and Mooney was a catalyst for it all coming together. He, he built a particularly deep connection with, uh, with Jackie Leibzig. Uh, the two men bounced rhythmic ideas off each other. Now, he wasn't in the best mental space during his uh, time in Cannes. Uh, he was in Germany in the first place to avoid being drafted into the US Army. Uh, he felt paranoid and isolated. Black American men were not common in Germany at that time. Uh, now, there's no suggestion that any of the members of the band were discriminatory at all, uh, but no doubt he will have felt the disapproving gaze of the older generation with his, his hippie garb and the, his sheer difference to the people who were, who were in the streets at the time. Uh, Mooney thankfully got to feeling a lot better after his time in camp, but he left behind some compelling performances. Uh, my own personal favourite is his recordings uh, with the band is The Thief. You Do Right is dominated by uh, Mooney and Leibniz. By all accounts, it was edited down from a six hour jam session, and this kind of editing would become a hallmark of Cam Records. They were born in quite a vibrant art scene uh, that grew up in their home city of Cologne. Um, but socially, they weren't really in touch with what was going on at the time. Uh, they weren't, Cannes were never an, an overtly political band. Um, their radical tendencies were confined to music, despite their names standing supposedly for communism, anarchism, nihilism. Uh, they didn't quite go that far. Um, they managed to exist in, in what was really a bourgeois, a uh, strata of society alongside university professors and media professionals. A lot of the music they produced at this time was done for and included in films and on TV. As experimental as they were in form, they were actually quite traditional in that they did jobs for money. Um, but mainly in student towns, uh, in 1968, protests really, really struck at the heart of German society. Now, the band Guru Guru, uh, they came out of the chaos of 1968. Uh, drummer drummer Manny, Manny Neumeyer, who formed Guru Guru in 1968, was, like Jackie Liebzit, uh, a free jazz alumni. He, he'd, he'd been playing free jazz drums for a couple of years now. He chose not to play monotonously, though. Um, the music of Guru Guru has the textures of heavy rock, but a rhythmic freeness. It's, it's highly uh, influenced by Jimi Hendrix, and it kind of at times sounds like things are on the Vertigo label in the UK. It's progressive, um, with a small P, uh, but definitely not prog in the mode of, say, Yes or Emerson, Lake and Palmer. At this time, Guru Guru were a kind of heavy, sludgy proposition. Uh, the wire and fuzz workouts come off like proto stoner rock. Uh, others, the, the mix is overwhelmed by electronic effects. All the way through, Neumeyer's drums ride the dynamics of the piece. The whole effect's kind of like free rock. There's ripples going through it and echoing distortion. Neumeyer would remain the only consistent figure in Guru Guru. Um, the band changed direction numerous times over the next few years and curiously became famous enough in Japan that his presence graced a waxwork museum for many years, along with a couple of more people that we'll get to quite soon. Cut from a similar kind of anarcho-revolutionary cloth were Amon Duel. Um, Amon Duel, or rather we're going to be talking about Amon Duel 2 specifically, grew out of a commune that was formed in early 1968. It was a, it was a loose group of mostly ex-boarding school students who'd grown up together. I'm using the term students loosely here. They dropped out of university on the whole um, to experiment with the, the format of social existence to, for new ways to have family units, um, which didn't include their parents. Of course, this experimentation and rejection of the parents uh, led to the withdrawal of parental financial support. 
So the commune needed a way to pay for all those lentils and downing thread. Um, as a few members already played instruments, they decided to form a band. Uh, and that band, that original commune, made a record quite by chance. It's of historical significance, but musically turgid. It sounds like what it is. It's amateur musicians jamming aimlessly, probably very stoned. One notable early member of the commune was Uschi Obermeier, uh, who was a German model and friend of Jimi Hendrix and Keith Richards. She played maracas. All commune members were not just invited, but basically required to participate. This while predating and superseding the punk ethic of, say, someone like Crass by uh, over a decade did not lead to a dynamic or thrilling record. Uh, the members of Amondul, who were musically competent, split off to form their own independent unit. They continued to live in communal circumstances. By all accounts, this meant that nobody took responsibility for paying the bills or doing the washing up. As a band, though, they were able to get it together in the studio and live. Their debut album, Fallas Day, was a, it was a relative hit in Germany, even with its obscene title, um, though it didn't get much radio play. There was a dearth of original, creative, native music in Germany. And that meant that Amondul could fill the vacuum with their own crazy noises. They studiously avoided listening to commercial music. Um, the likes of Eric Clapton were verboten so as not to absorb cliched influences and licks. Like all of that generation of musicians, they were struggling to break free and create new forms. What that meant was long jam sessions, overdubbing, a few psychedelics along the way to shake the cobwebs out. By the time of Yeti, their second album, they were tight and intent on creating a new form of German rock music. There's a little of Frank Zappa's influence in the wacky song titles and time signatures. Uh, there's a lot of the Anything Goes approach of psychedelia, and especially a lot of more out there territory that Pink Floyd were exploring in the late 60s before they dialed back the weirdness. Yeti was a double album and was split between a, a disc of relatively conventional songs and a second of longer extended jams. Archangel's Thunderbird from the first disc is probably their most famous song. It was a brainchild of vocalist Renate Naup and it slaps. Naup based it on a, a childhood hymn and the, the band supplied a dynamic arrangement. It's at the junction of Louie Louie and the Jefferson Airplane. However, it's a vocal performance that makes the song. Krautrock was dominated by men, even though feminism was definitely a part of the counterculture. Communes tended to be egalitarian, but bands in general were, were for boys to play. Uh, Renate Naup was a very rare example of a woman being an integral part of uh, one of the bands of that era. Her voice here is stride and proud. For me, I think there's a similarity to what Sandy Denny was doing with Fairport Convention at the time, taking uh, traditional melodies and, and putting them with the sound of an electric rock band. She's got a little of the same tone as well. And maybe my ears deceive me, but I can hear the roots of a lot of punk vocals in the delivery. Keen in quality that uh, John Lydon had or the intensity of polystyrene. Uh, this song was covered by The Breeders a few years ago. They did a good version of it. We'll be coming back to Amondul, but in the meantime, they kept living chaotically, playing tours and moving around. Quite apart from the argy bargy agit prop of the 68 generation, uh, like Amondul and Guru Guru, were craft work. The craft work, Gestamtkunstwerk, or full life at work, really only got off the ground in 1974 with Autobahn. Their life project was the creation of a vision of a, fu of a fusion between man and machine. And it's one that we'll be returning to later on in this series. Before all of that, they were an experimental music ensemble. Ralph Hutter and Florian Schneider met at a music conservatory where, where they were studying piano and flute respectively and improvisation together. 
They discovered a shared love for music like the Velvet Underground and the Stooges. Uh, the two of them decided to form a band, one that would use electronics to make sounds as intense as those bands were. Hutter came from a mildly musical family, he studied piano from an early age. He had a comfortable middle class upbringing which he infers was lacking in guidance. It's difficult to know anything about Ralph Hutterville because he's given so few interviews and he's a very private individual. He is on record as saying though that he considered that his generation had no fathers in that they could not forgive what their father's generation had allowed to happen during the Second World War. Schneider was a lot richer than Hutter. He had a very cultured background. His family going back generations were architects, sculptors and artists. Um, his old father was a very successful architect. He, he designed Cologne Bonn Airport. Now, curiously, air travel is kind of the missing craftwork theme. They preferred cars, trains and especially bicycles. His father's millionaire lifestyle meant that Florian Schneider had startup capital. He had money to buy expensive and ex exotic import records on a whim. He also had access to a beautifully furnished home with swimming pool that was perfect for parties. His parents were very often away on business or holiday. The Schneider house became a bit of a hangout for Dusseldorf music heads. This money also enabled Schneider to build up an arsenal of instruments, acoustic and electronic. He invested in filters, ring modulators, echo units. Uh, Hutter had his, his keyboards. Uh, he was a very big fan of the doors and for a time Kraftwerk actually went by the name Organization, which I can't help thinking is a pun on the fact that he was such a big fan of the organ. Anyway, they experimented in plugging all these devices together. They ran Florian Schneider's flute through there. They engaged with other musicians and made three albums, working with producer Connie Plank. Now, at this time, Kraftwerk itself was like kind of like a collective with rotating personnel. The only constant was Florian Schneider. Even Hutter was absent for nearly a year studying architecture. The albums they made at this time are edited out of the official Kraftwerk story. Uh, they don't have a united theme, they don't have a concept. They are, however, important documents. And in Rukzuk, there is a genuine banger of a tune. Uh, but I can completely understand why they chose to exclude all of this. It's inconsistent, it's occasionally embarrassingly naive. Um, by way of proof, here is a, a clickbait titled video of Ralph Hutter playing a guitar with a mullet. Kraftwerk really did invent the 1980s, acid bass lines and all. The most bizarre detail for all of, of all this for me is that this kind of thing was getting airplay on German television, and it was. Rucksack was used for TV spots, uh, and it was a bit of a, a kind of a sleeper radio hit. Uh, lots of DJs liked it, and they played it a lot. For a while, Schneider enlisted the help of Michael Rota and Klaus Dinger. These two young men went on to form Neu and make some very important records with Connie Plank. Now, we'll be coming back to Neu in due course. And of course, we'll be coming back to Kraftwerk as well. Heidelberg and Munich, the homes of Guru Guru and Amondil, both had kind of anarchic, crazy tendencies. But Berlin was something else. Berlin was an island for a start. It was stranded in the middle of East Germany. It had different rules. Berlin residents didn't need to do national service, so young people flocked there. There were drugs, there were parties, it was hippie heaven. In many ways, Krautrock was the late flowering of psychedelia. And pop culture moved so quick at the uh, cusp of the 70s that artists in Britain and the US had on the whole stopped experimenting. They'd stopped being in the style of those UFO parties that, uh, that are so famous with all the crazy light shows. Uh, artists had started to get, be authentic. Um, in the style of Dylan's basement tapes. They were started going back to their roots, preferably in the countryside. Uh, the musicians living in Berlin didn't have the choice of spending time in nature. They were surrounded by East Germany. If anywhere in uh, West Germany was a bubble, it was Berlin. Tangerine Dream 
evolved through the experimental arts lab scene of West Berlin. The main protagonist, Edgar Froese, um, who's been the only constant member through the, through, through the whole career of Tangerine Dream, was born in East Prussia at the very end of the war. He studied and worked as a sculptor before kind of drifting into music. Now, West Berlin was reportedly a terrible place to organise concerts. Audiences would decide en masse in the moment their plans. No advance tickets were sold. Maybe if there was a football match won or lost, nobody would turn up. If they did, maybe they'd be late. Up until the 1980s, it was customary for bands to start up to an hour after the advertised time, such was the uh, predictable chaos of the city. Parties were ad hoc and often involved live music. Nowadays they'd have a DJ, but bands like Tangerine Dream uh, kind of filled up the space that was necessary to perform at these places. Tangerine Dream themselves were formed at one of these venues called the Zodiac Free Arts Lab, uh, when Edgar Froese meet, met drummer Klaus Schultz. They wore the psychedelic influences proudly, the name being taken from a mishearing of the lyrics to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. When they started, they were a kind of nervy, psychedelic beat combo. They played at free parties in arts labs and reclaimed spaces throughout the city. That sound changed quickly. Um, Froese worked with many different musicians. He changed instruments too. Their first album, Electronic Meditation was tape collage, music concrete and primitive electronics alongside Klaus Schultz thundering drums. Um, by the time they recorded their second, they included a lot more standard instrumentation and a lot more spaces between the sounds. Um, the standard instrumentation on, on the second album, Atem, uh, was namely flute and keyboards. Keyboards being organs and mellotron. In the years to come, the name Tangerine Dream would become synonymous with synthesizers. So this was the start of their journey on there. With Alpha Centauri, uh, their third album, they kind of centered more on the Cosmic sound. It was frequently floating. Um, the Mellotron and Flute drift together in a pool of reverb together. At times it could be kind of a far out instrumental for a sci-fi movie. Now at the same time as Alpha Centauri, there's a personal favorite of mine, the track Ultima Fuel, which came out on a seven inch you know, on two parts. So there's one part on each, uh, on each side of the record. First part's very much in the vein of classic psychedelia. It's, called, it's using what's called the Andalusian cadence, which is a descending chord sequence that has kind of a regal feel. It's very, uh, it's very poignant sounding. All this with a pretty tight sounding garage band as well. Um, and then there's the second, more ambient sounding part with wobbly mellotrons to the fore. So, Berlin was a bubble. There were musicians and freaks working together in a patchwork of projects. Klaus Schultz had played drums on the first Tangerine Dream album, of course, and soon after he got to working with Manuel Gotching. Gotching was a, a young guitarist who loved American English music like The Who. He'd really fallen for uh, the proto-punk American band Blue Cheer. Uh, these were bands that were using distortion in a way that's not too far away from what we now know as stoner rock. Um, as an instrumental three-piece, Ashra Temple recorded a debut album consisting of two side-long pieces of music. At times it's like a cross between live Jimi Hendrix, The Who, uh, or indeed The Groundhogs live at Leeds. R.I.P. to Tony McPhee for the other week, by the way. Um, a great talent and much missed. Uh, in this was this was sh in short amped up rock. Uh, Klaus Schultz, who again thundering away on the drums here, he'd he'd move away from percussions and go almost completely beatless over the next uh, next few years. We'll come back to come back to what he did later on. 
but for now this was rock music informed by free jazz a little like guru guru were um it, not so much about melodic content as being a primal howl it's a huge cavernous sounding record and it's difficult to believe as a work for of young men who barely finished school at the time Godshing was plugging his guitar into effects boxes and lots of implication. Um, wah wah, fuzz, echo, it's the last of those that go on to be his trademark in later years. Um, Ashra Temple albums after this would be a lot cleaner sounding. None would ever be as raw and live. This is the sound of a young band playing hard in a room. Both uh, Klaus Schultz and Manuel Godshing joined Guru Guru's Manny Neumeyer in the Tokyo Wax Museum. And that about wraps it up for this episode. Um, thanks for listening, watching. Please like, subscribe, share, all that business. Um, until the next time, thanks a lot. Bye.